Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia and amen. Good morning and welcome to another wonderful day. This is the sixth Sunday of Easter. So the Easter season is drawing to a close, but Easter is every day for the Christians. So we rejoice in the resurrection of Jesus Christ every single day because it is Christmas and Easter for the Christian every day. So what a wonderful holiday to live in, to rejoice in. The sixth Sunday of Easter also means that this Thursday is what's called Ascension uh, Ascension Day or Ascension Thursday in the Christian church. What that means is that it is 40 days then after Jesus' resurrection from the grave on Easter morning where he um, uh, now has been ministering and uh, not ministering but visiting other people and making his presence known after the resurrection. So now he ascends back into heaven to take his rightful place on the throne of God. And so uh, this Sunday... Uh, the reading and the Gospels usually uh, reflect on, are we going to be left then as orphans? And the answer is absolutely not, because Jesus sends us his spirit. So we are never, ever alone. Um, the message for today is going to be based on the first Peter reading, which is also one of my favorite readings in all of Scripture. But why don't we open up with prayer? Let us pray. O oh God, the giver of all that is good, by your holy inspiration, grant that we may think those things that are right, and by your merciful guiding, accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading for today is from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 to 22. And this is uh, the readings that we'll be having yet for this week and next week. St. Peter writes in the Bible, now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, uh, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts regard Christ, the Lord, as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that, when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he may bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the spirit, uh, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. This is the word of the Lord. The gospel for today is recorded for us in... John chapter 14, verses 15 to 21. Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be, with you, uh, will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in the Father, and uh, that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. This is the gospel of the Lord. 
Today's sermon is, uh, message is going to be more like an expository sermon because uh, this First Peter passage is really interesting. And it also helps us to remember what Jesus is saying in the gospel about keeping the commandments, keeping his commandments. It's not something that we do to, uh, uh, to inherit heaven or to get in good with God. But when Jesus says to keep or obey my commandments, it means to listen to them. In the Hebrew, that's what that means, to listen to them and to internalize them, to make them your own. You have a new life in baptism, and because of that, the Holy Spirit dwells within you. That's the certainty and the assurance that we have of God's love for you, that he gives you the Holy Spirit. And God does this um, in baptism. You see, baptism isn't just plain old water, as if it's just like dishwater or bath water, something like that. But this water does something very special. God delivers himself to you in baptism. Now he does this so that we can have certainty. Can God come to us any way he wishes? He certainly can. But he says, if you want to be certain, here is my address. I come to you in my word, which is the Bible only, not the Book of Mormon, not the Quran, not anything else, just the book called the Bible, and it's not the uh, Jehovah Witnesses' New World Translation either, because that translation makes Jesus out to be pretty much just a human and not God. But God's Word in the Bible, the inspired scriptures of God and um, also uh, inerrant without error, tells us that he comes to us in his Word and in his sacraments. And those sacraments are baptism and the Lord's Supper. And that's why I love this Peter passage. Because Peter, remember, has to tell his, uh, you know, has to encourage his um, readers and the Christians, those early Christians, not to abandon the faith. And so we're just going to go through this a little bit because there's a wonderful hymn that we'll be having afterwards too. It's, I'm, um, I'm God's child. I gladly say it, I am baptized into Christ. I fumbled up the uh, title, but you'll hear it, and it's wonderful. So let's just go through this passage a little bit, uh, like a mini Bible study or expository. In the first verse, 13, uh, Peter says, Now who is there to harm you if you, are, uh, if you are zealous for what is good? Basically what he's saying there is he's saying, Hey, step back. Remember who you are and whose you are. You have a new identity, and that identity is in Jesus Christ, the one crucified for you and also risen from the grave. Nothing can keep him down. That's in whom you are baptized. And also whose you are. You belong to God. You are a treasured possession, a holy nation, a royal priesthood. So remember that. But he also goes on to say, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, well, what does righteousness sake mean? Well, in this context, in this part of the Bible, the way it's written is, for doing what is right, for doing what is good. See, the Christian now has a new life and a new life change. Our old life is in the past. That's our time before Jesus, and we would think differently, act differently, behave differently, and things along that line. But now Peter says you have a new life in Christ, which means now we live out the salvation that God has already given to us. And by doing that, that means our lives change, our communication changes, the way we view the world changes. We start seeing it from Christ's perspective and not from a worldly perspective. And so we'll be doing things that are right and good. Are we going to do them perfectly? No. But he says, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake or for doing what is right, you will be blessed. Now, it doesn't mean that... Um, when you do these things, then you will be blessed, but rather you are already blessed by God. You have all the rights and privileges of being one of God's dear children. So then he goes on to say, have no fear of them. Them are the ones who are mocking or persecuting the Christians because of their faith and because they have uh, uh, abandoned the old pagan ways. Remember that they have... Um, in their family's eyes and friends' eyes, they have turned their backs on them, but that is not the case. They have a new life in Christ. So have no fear of them, nor be troubled. Verse 15, but in your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Well, what is that hope? 
That hope is the new life, the resurrection life that's found only in Jesus Christ through faith in him. And that, dear friends, is revealed in baptism. That's where God has given you his Holy Spirit. So now you have a defense and that doesn't mean going up and starting arguments with people about, hey, I'm right and you're wrong. But basically, it's looking for opportunities where people will see, hey, this, this person is a Christian and, and he or she does live differently or acts differently or has a different kind of a hope. That hope is uh, a confidence. And our confidence is rooted in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And God's promise is made and kept in him. You see, God has done everything that he can do, and now we just wait for him to, uh, uh, for Jesus to return again. And that's our hope. And that's what gives us confidence as we face all kinds of challenges in our own lives as well. And so people will see how we look differently or act differently. For instance, when I was in seminary, I worked at a, a five-star or a fine dining restaurant for the most part, and uh, the cash register was behind the bar, and uh, I and another fellow seminarian, uh, when we were going through seminary, were the bartenders. So on the weekends, the owner was very thankful because he knew that his uh, big takes for money was on the weekend and every shift was covered by somebody who was going to be a pastor. But then uh, uh, the wait staff would look at me and say, well, Mike, how come you're not drinking behind the bar? Well, we're not supposed to. Mike, how come you're not giving away drinks? Well, I'm not supposed to. That's stealing. Mike, how come you're paying for the food you eat? Well, we're supposed to, otherwise it's called stealing. Mike, how come you don't do this, that, or the other thing? And see, through the actions, just living out our faith and doing what is right, it begins to show others that, you know, a Christian is different from the ways of people in the world who don't know Christ. And that's what Peter is writing about here, that have no fear of them, but be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. See, our hope is in Jesus Christ. And so think about why that is, that it's important for you. And if you're new to Christianity or you're exploring Christianity, that hope is always that our lives have been changed. We, Jesus, by his death and resurrection, has removed us from sin and death to life and holiness. And that is the free gift that God gives to you in baptism. Then he goes on to say, yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Basically, when you uh, persecute somebody who's doing right stuff, that's idiotic. I mean, if somebody's doing something weird or stupid or wrong, there might be a reason, you know, to call them to the carpet, but not if you're doing something right. Who in their right mind would do that? Even back then, but some people would do that, okay? Verse 17, for it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. You see, God works in his own ways, and sometimes a Christian will be persecuted and will have to suffer because of our Christian faith. And if that would be the case, we still don't take revenge because Jesus never took revenge. Look what happened to Jesus. He was rejected by men, as we heard last week. He was rejected by the people, but he was precious in God's eyes. And God's opinion is all that matters. And through faith in Christ, you too are precious in God's eyes. Um, and that means you might be rejected and persecuted because of that. And then he goes on to the baptism part which I love. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. In uh, Christian terms and sometimes scholarly terms, we call this the great exchange. There on the cross, Jesus exchanged our unrighteousness and our sins and our unholiness for his righteousness, holiness, and uh, perfection in God's eyes. In baptism, this is the gift that God gives to you. He exchanges one for the other. You don't have to do anything for it. He comes knocking at your heart and he comes in. Otherwise, you can reject him, as I mentioned last week, but you know what? That's foolish because this is free. You, um, and this is what Christ did for you on the cross and you receive this exchange in baptism. And this righteousness then of Christ is so that now Jesus at that time on the last day brings us to God, being put to death in the flesh, that's Jesus on the cross, but made alive in the spirit. 
in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Well, what is this about? Well, there's something called the Apostles' Creed in the Christian church. Many churches uh, uh, confess this or say this because this is what they believe. I don't know why there's some Christian churches, they don't want to bind themselves to a creed. They think it's too confining, and then they have to sort of, um, you know, uh, are relegated to that. Well, there's nothing wrong to being relegated to this because it's all out of the Bible. Part of the Apostles' Creed says, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. And that's where we get this part of the creed from, is in this part of the Bible. From 1 Peter 3, where uh, verses 19 and tw uh, 20, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey or listen to God. That's where spirits that's where people's souls, that's where people end up for eternity if they do not listen and uh, receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. This does not mean that Jesus gives them another chance to get out of hell and um, uh, the eternal change, uh, chains, as it says here. But he went down to hell, literally, to proclaim victory, that he is God's Messiah and Savior, that they rejected him, and he is the victor. And that's not what God wants for you, dear friend. So listen and obey. Jesus is your free, uh, free gift. And so because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. This reflects and connects us literally into the flood of Noah. That flood story is found in Genesis 6, 7, I think eight and nine, and, and this uh, true story is about how God called Noah to build a boat, an ark, on dry land, and to bring all the animals in, each one according to its kind. You can go to the Ark Encounter um, or um, Answers in Genesis website so you can get more information on how this all uh how this all could be and take place because it actually works scientifically. But God uh, brought down the flood waters after his patience ran out. It took 70 years. So that's God's grace. But finally, he brought judgment down on a wicked world. People rejected him. And so uh, they had opportunity to uh, come on in the ark, but they mocked God, made fun of him. And then finally on that day, the door was shut. People were pounding on the door to let them in, but by then it was too late. And that reflects also the judgment of God God coming again on the last day. When Jesus returns, it will be too late to repent and turn to him. So his call is of grace uh, and mercy right now. Turn to him. And how can you be certain of that? Well, he gives us baptism. And in baptism, it links us literally to the, the flood. Because the verse says, baptism saves you guys now. A lot of people think that baptism is just water and that it's just something we do for God. But the arrow goes the other way. It's what the gift that God gives to us. There's nothing dependent upon it. We don't have to make sure that we pay, pray the uh, believer's prayer correctly or things like that. And we need this baptism because it's not just a removal of dirt from the body. That's not what it is. It doesn't wash it that clean. It washes your sins and your soul clean so that you are pure in the eyes of God. And that's how God delivers his Holy Spirit. It's through the waters of baptism. God connects himself in the water. He puts himself in there so that the delivery system is the water. Once the water is long gone, the baptism, uh, the spirit, still remains behind. And you can be certain of that. When Satan starts whispering in your ear that you are not worth it, that God does not love you, that your sins are going to keep you out of heaven, or that there are other ways to heaven besides God, just uh, besides Jesus, you say, no, Satan, you stop whispering in my ear. I am a baptized child of God. In baptism, friend, God claimed you, lock, stock, and barrel. He knows what he was getting into. He came for the sinner and to make you a saint. That's the power of God's word. He brought creation, everything out of nothing. And he makes sinners like you and me into saints, holy in his eyes, only through faith in Jesus Christ. In baptism, God has put the white robe of righteousness and holiness on you, and you can be certain of that because the waters came upon your forehead and upon your heart. 
When you travel to the font or to the bowl with the water or into a river or into a pool uh, to be baptized, God's power comes and connects into that water. It is not just simple water, and it's not just plain old words, but it's the Word of God that brought everything out of nothing and comes to you and creates you into a new creation. He brings you from hell into his kingdom and rule and reign. He brings you from darkness and into his marvelous light. And that, dear friend, is what baptism is all about, because it is through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That little English word through means that you are rooted and connected into the resurrection. So what happens to Jesus? happens to you. You died on the cross with him. You were united and intertwined with him because Christ did that for you on the cross. But then he also intertwines his resurrection into your life. And that's what baptism is all about. So God's blessings to each and every one of you. Have a great day in the Lord. The sun is still shining. The moon is still bright. The stars are still twinkling. The colors are out. And listen now to the words of the next hymn because they're beautiful and they are for you. Amen. Since I